Good morning. Ooh, knew I was forgetting something. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to see you all here. Welcome to First Christian Church. Glad that you are with us on this 15th day of September. We're halfway through September. Can you believe that? Hard to believe, but yet here we are. It is also uh, the third Sunday of the month, which is kind of mathematically weird, but it is, trust me, and that means that uh, loaves and fishes and plus pantry is happening today, so a lot going on in the life of our church. Let us know that you are here. You can fill out a connection card, drop it in an offering play as you make your way out following this time of worship, and uh, <clears throat> do take note that we, <clears throat> excuse me, are having coffee fellowship today. I was informed of that. There might have been a misprint in one of the screens, so if you happen to see that and go, oh, darn, we're not having coffee fellowship, well, good news. We are indeed having our coffee fellowship following this time of worship. A few other announcements, some really good news. Richard Sellers is back home after, yes, yes, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Richard is home after a long stint in the hospital and uh, is continuing his recovery. I invite you to continue to keep Richard and Sharon in your prayers as they continue down this uh, long road of recovery. And uh, just uh, keep them in your prayers. Uh, things keep going and getting better and better. This weekend, uh, the Women's Retreat is going to be setting out on Friday to Chautauqua for their uh, Women's Retreat weekend. Uh, and the Women's Retreat is actually going to meet today, uh, following this time of worship, for a meeting and organization and getting things in order for the retreat. If, uh, if you still want to be a part of that, I bet you can sneak your way into that. So you could uh, pop into that meeting after church and uh, find out more and find out how you can get yourself to be part of the Women's Women's Retreat starting uh, this, uh, this Friday. As I mentioned, uh, Loaves and Fishes is today, and uh, we're also going to start uh, collecting, if anybody is uh, so inclined, some paper products for our Plus Pantry, the Plus Pantry Paper Product Procurement. <laughs> As you know, everything in the church has to have alliteration like that, so it's true. <laughs> I can, but I'm going to, I won't. I don't, want, I don't want to embarrass, you know, make anybody feel bad. It's like, oh, he's so good. So, man, he's so linguistically adept at things, isn't he? <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, so, if you want to bring in a paper towel, toilet paper, that sort of thing, we'll uh, be uh, taking those in. It's always great to have uh, some of those to give out to our guests who come for the pantry. Also, collecting for bulldog bags, mac and cheese cups uh, for the next uh, few weeks as well. Uh, and then, uh, if you haven't seen it, the Spiritware uh, ordering opportunity that's out in the gathering area, check it out. See how you can uh, find some First Christian Church Spiritware of various kinds, sweatshirts, t-shirts, etc. Um, taking orders uh, for those items out in the gathering area. So like I said, that's what's going on in the life of the church. More information about it all in your bulletin. Check it out and uh, see how you can be a part of things. But let us continue to be part of this time of worship, and let us do so as we stand, as you're able, and join together it's from singing from our chalice praise hymnal, hymn number 119, What the Lord Has Done in Me. Let us sing.
call to worship comes from Psalms chapter 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they power forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into, unto all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuits to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Please pray with me. Lord, as we explore the concept of your personal invocation, we seek to deepen our connection with you. May this lead to a more profound and meaningful relationship with you. As we call upon your name in the quiet moments of our hearts, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalms 29, verse 11. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord, will, the Lord will bless his people with peace. Please share the peace of Christ with those around you. Peace. Peace. Keep an eye on her, we. Peace. If I were any better, I'd be... I know, I know. <laughs> no. Good morning. Peace. Hi, Dorothy. Peace be Peace. with you. Peace. Peace. Peace, Scott. Peace, Sandy. Peace, John. Peace, Good. Making your way up here? Yes, sir. Good morning. Peace.
I want to invite our children for, for our children's message. <clears throat> Choir, we love that song, and we love it when you guys bring it to us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, come on down, kiddos. Oh. All right, how are you guys doing? Doing good? Good, good. So I learned something about myself recently. So my wife really likes flowers, right? And she's always dropping little hints about, oh, you know, I like flowers. And, and so I was like, okay, yeah, I got to get some flowers once in a while. But you know, they're so expensive, right? So I thought, I'm not going to buy flowers, seeds are so much cheaper, right? I'll just grow her flowers, right? Well, this is what I learned about myself. I'm not very good <laughs> at growing flowers. So I'm not sure what I've done wrong here, but as you can see, the flowers I was trying to grow died a horrible death. And I just don't get it, right? You put the seed in the dirt, right? And I got some dirt. I mean, I just found some along the side of the driveway, and I just grabbed it up, right? And, and then, you know, I heard that you put water in it, and I did that once. And then I also heard, I also heard that worms are good for the, the dirt, right? Now, I don't, I don't like real worms because they're creepy and kind of slimy sometimes. But I do really like gummy worms. And so I thought, well, I'll just put a gummy worm in there with the, with the seeds and the plant and, and, and then a light, right? It needs light. So I would I put, put it near a lamp, right? So, and then, you know, the, it didn't do so good. I'm not sure what I did wrong. I thought I did all the right stuff, right? Dirt, gave it water once, uh, a worm, right? Um, and, you know, I turned on that lamp next to it. Do you, do you guys know why it didn't, didn't grow very good? It needs real sunlight, huh? This actually needs to water it more than once. I have to water it more than once. Is this true? And I need real worms. What about what about dirt from the side of the driveway? There might be some rocks in there too. I don't. I don't know. It's not very good dirt, is it? No. Oh my gosh! See, you guys are helping me to understand all the things that I did wrong, right? Because you can't just water. One. I I left some water nearby, but the in a in a bottle, but the plant didn't get it. I, don't, I thought it would just go and get the water, but it didn't. All right, so I guess um, now I have a few things to learn, right? So keep watering the plant, right? Give it good soil. Real worms are way better than gummy worms. Okay, that's a good one. These are all really helpful insights that you guys are giving to me, and this actually makes me think a lot about the writer of a letter in the Bible. Writer of a letter to the Hebrews. They wrote a letter, and then they were talking about faith, right? And we don't just one day wake up and say, oh, I guess I'll have some faith today, right? No, we actually have to grow our faith, right? Grow our faith in God. But to grow our faith in God does not mean we just stick a seed of faith into some ground and expect it to blossom, do we, right? We have to work at it. We have to tend to it. We have to help it grow. I didn't do a very good job helping this flower grow, right? So do you think that the flower needs good soil, right? Well, I think the same is true for our faith, right? We need good soil so that that seed of faith and take root and grow up. Does a flower blossom when it has water? Of course, right? Does it blossom when it has sunlight? You're absolutely right, it does. But the writer isn't just giving good plant food and plant growing advice here. 
How we grow our faith is the same way that we grow plants and flowers. A plant grows when we have good soil, right, in our lives. It grows when we water it and give it plenty of sunlight. Our faith grows when it's rooted, when there's good roots. What do you think it needs to be rooted in? Do you think rooted in love is a good thing? How about rooted in kindness and compassion? Those good things? How about rooted in helpfulness? Yeah. yeah, I think so too. Even though those things might seem like little things to do, right? When we do those things, when we have good soil so that our roots can grow and they are rooted in kindness and compassion and love and peace, then I think our faith is not only going to grow, but it's going to grow big and strong. Just like if we gave our plants and our seeds good things to grow in, I think I would have had much better luck. Does anybody want this dirty old gummy worm? I don't blame you. I wouldn't want it either. That's why we need to have, have good things in our lives, right? Instead of dirty old gummy worm type things. Well, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for planting in us Seeds of faith. Help us nurture these seeds with love, peace, and kindness. So our faith grows bigger and stronger. Amen. Thank you, guys. See you later. <laughs>
that are trying to be faithful to Christ and to Christ's teachings, but they're still trying to figure it out, trying to make sense of all of it. And so here in the 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, the writer is talking about and teaching about faith. And they write, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Through this, he received approval as righteous, God giving himself approval to his gifts. He died, but through his faith, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For it was attested before he was taken away that he had pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach God must believe that God exists and that God rewards those who seek God. By faith, Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he stayed for a time in the land, and he had promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. By faith, Abraham set out for a place, not knowing where he was going. How's your faith these days? I ask that question because there are events, times, and seasons in each of our lives when everything we thought we knew or believed is called into question. Times when the narrative of our life has been displaced, challenged, or maybe even shattered. Times when we no longer know what we believe about God or life or even the world. We're not sure where to place our trust or in what to hope. I've had moments like this. I grew up in the church, Sunday school, youth group, camp, even got a call to ministry. But when I went to college, everything I thought I knew and believed was called into question. My faith was challenged. It was even shattered. But it turned into a blessing. Same can be said about my time in seminary. Same can be said about relationships or certain periods in our lives when we whatever. Some events, times, and seasons leave us wondering if this kind of challenge can happen to people who are supposed to have faith and rewards from God, then how do we live now 
How do we move forward from these difficult times? Well-meaning people might say something like, just have a little more faith, or you need to have a stronger faith. As well-meaning as it may be intended, statements like that have never helped me. What are we supposed to do after tragedy strikes and our hearts have been broken and our worlds have been shattered? I wish it were as simple as ordering up some faith, but I don't believe for a second it is. I think we are always working out our faith, growing it. And sometimes that means we will have to set out, like Abraham, to places unknown. And yes, we do so by faith, even if it's not by our own faith. When our text for today is read, it's Assume that it is by Abraham's faith and his belief in God that he obeyed and set out for a place not knowing where he was going. It's assumed it was because of Abraham's incredibly strong faith that he set out. It's a nice thought, but it can set us up to think and maybe believe that we are not as strong or not as faithful as Abraham. A thought that can actually keep us from ever setting out by faith. So here's what I wonder. What if it's not Abraham's faith that he sets out by? What if it's just the opposite? What if it was by God's faith in Abraham that Abraham set out for a new homeland, even when he didn't know where it was, how he would get there, or what he would find? To me, that idea makes a lot more sense. After all, haven't there been times in your life when someone encouraged you, someone comforted you, and stood by you? They believed in you had faith in you, and that made all the difference for you. You did more than you thought you could. You overcame what you thought was impossible. You got through a situation you never thought you would. What did that do for you? It made you strong, stronger than you thought you ever could be. It made you see a possibility you didn't think would be possible before. You didn't have faith to believe you could, but then someone came along and told you you could have the faith that you could. If we come to this text with that perspective, we can begin to see that Faith never has to be an either or. Either you have enough or you need more. It lets us ask questions. Questions like, what if faith is more about what God believes about us than what we believe about God? What if faith is our experience of God desiring us, calling us, connecting and reconnecting with us? What if God's faith in us is a call to live as fully as we can in this moment? What if God's faith invites us to reimagine ourselves as more than our history, as more than what has happened to us? If that's what faith is like, then what do you think is God's desire for you today? In what ways is God calling you? What difference does God's faith and belief in you make in you? I used to think faith meant living with absolutes and certainties, having no doubts, asking no questions. 
You towed the line, and as long as you towed the line, abided and obeyed, then you were good to go. And consequently, that is exactly what was challenged when I went off to college. Today, that feels more like fear and fundamentalism than faithfulness. Absolutes, certainties, having no doubts, asking no questions. Is that what God really wants? Is that what God expects? Or does it make more sense that our all-knowing creator understands there cannot always be absolutes and certainties, understands there will be doubts and questions, and yet with a bit of encouragement rooted in God's faith in us, we can work our way through the hard struggles even when we don't see a way to move forward. Let's not forget, Abraham set out not knowing where he was going. His life and journey were as open-ended as yours and mine. So could it be that faith can be the willingness to show up and live with uncertainty in an ever-changing world? What if faith isn't about having or even needing to have answers, but rather faith is about asking a better question, a deeper question, one that helps us discover meaning and live more wholeheartedly and moves us forward even when we don't know where we're going. If that's what faith is like, then what are the deep questions that you need to ask in your life today? And what would it be like to ask and explore those questions? What if doubts and questions aren't failures, but what if doubts and questions are actually prayers? Prayers and invitations for the Holy Spirit to offer a word of wisdom, guidance, comfort, and hope. What if setting out by faith is about asking a better question? What would you ask? There have been times in my life when I tried to manufacture faith or get more faith as if it were a possession to be amassed. I suspect we've all said or thought to ourselves, well, I I guess I just need to have a little more faith. The problem is, that's never worked for me. I've never figured out how to get a little more faith. And the reason I've never figured out how to get a little more faith is because the struggle is never about quantity or the size of faith. Jesus really meant what he said about faith the size of a mustard seed being enough. Faith isn't something we acquire or get for ourselves. Faith is something We've all already been given. It's inane. It's a part of us. And the reason for our struggles of faith is because we convince ourselves we don't have enough in us. But here's what changes the false belief. God knows that we do have enough faith in us, more than enough faith in us. Because we do, the reality is that our ability or inability to overcome our struggles and challenges is never about the size or quantity of our faith. Our struggles aren't struggles and challenges because we're not living out our faith. Our struggles and our challenges are are because we are living out of our fears. More often than not, when I've struggled with faith, fear was somewhere in the mix of all of it. The enemy and thief of faith is not doubt. The enemy and thief of faith is fear. 
That's why so often Jesus said, do not be afraid. He's not asking us to ignore or deny our fears. Rather, Jesus is encouraging us, empowering us to face our fears. Look at them square in the eye and see that though they have power against us, our faith and our faith in God and God's faith in us gives us the strength and ability to overcome those fears. What are you afraid of today? What is robbing you of faith? Keeping you from setting out for a new homeland, reimagining your life and living as fully as you can imagine in this moment. Are you afraid you're not going to be able to get it all done? Are you afraid you will fail? Are you afraid you won't have enough time? Are you afraid you're running out of time? Whatever you are afraid of, know this. God isn't. God isn't. God's faith in us is the source of the courage needed to face our fears. No, faith will not eliminate our fears. But God's faith in us empowers our faith, empowers our belief that there is something in us, something part of us that is more important, more capable, and stronger than anything we fear. And do you know what that something is? That something that is more important than what you or I fear? That something is you and me. We are more important than what we fear. We are more capable than our fears want us to know. We are stronger than anything we fear. And that is what faith is. And when we begin to live with that faith, when we, like Abraham, set out, not even knowing where God is taking us, well, The doors that will be open to us are incomprehensible. What doors are being opened to us? What possibilities are we not thinking about because we're scared? What could we do as that kind of people of faith? What could we do as that kind of faithful church? What, could, what would it be like for you and me, for our church to say yes to the faith God has in us and then set out by faith? What could be? What could God make happen through us? What could God make happen through our church if we set out by faith, but not by our faith, but by the faith God has in us? What could be? Amen. Let's join together our hearts once more as we go to God through our prayers. Gracious God, the same love and faithfulness you showed to Abraham, you bless us with. And like with Abraham, you answer our prayers and meet our needs, often in ways we never imagined possible. And because we know this and of your willingness to bless us again and again, we come to you with confidence 
praying for a path toward a deeper faith in you to be shown to us. Lord God, we look around and see so much pain and suffering, so much anger, frustration, and despair near and far. We see these struggles and challenges and we'll let faithless questions invade our minds and hearts, causing us to wonder why you allow such to happen. Remind us, holy God, you letting such happen is untrue. Remind us you are responding to the pain and suffering in the world, calling us all into that work with confidence and faith that with you, we can help ease the pain and suffering. But admittedly, we look at your church, Lord, the church global and the church local, and we can't help but wonder if it's even possible to make a difference. So many see the church as irrelevant or as a source of hate and judgment, which is why we need your faith, Holy One. So we are enabled to again be your faith-filled disciples who share your good news. Give us the faith to know your church can work together, serving in a manner worthy of the good news we've received while offering our lives in service to your kingdom. For the last are first, and the first are last, and there is grace enough for any and everyone. So to make this happen, we pray you give us faith and courage to live as those who will never give up and who will never give in to fear. Give us faith and courage to live out and share actions that bear witness to your faith in us, to make a meaningful impact, to overcoming all struggles and all challenges. Please hear now the prayers we need to lift to you as we do so in this time of holy silence. All this we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us open our hearts and spirits to gathering at our Lord's communion table. And may we do so as we sing together our communion hymn.
It's not easy to grow a deeper faith. And it's not easy to have faith in ourselves, particularly in those times of life where we are challenged and when lives are shattered. And Jesus understood this reality. And it is among the reasons why Jesus set this table so that we could come to it again and again, so that we could hear his voice saying, come to this table and remember me. Remember the one who taught. Remember the one who healed. Remember the one who loves you so much that I died for you, so that you could live. All that is at this table is a reminder of what Jesus knows is within us. The ability to persevere and overcome that which challenges us and shatters us. And when we partake of these elements, these gifts, we are reminded that we never do it alone. That there is one who is far greater than us, who has belief and faith in us, that when we follow him, we will overcome any challenge, and we will overcome any fear. So let us come to this table and be reminded of this truth. Be reminded of the one who has the ultimate faith in each of us. It was on that night before Jesus was crucified when he gathered with his disciples. And during that holy meal, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat of this, all of you. For this bread is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it and do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, Jesus took a cup And giving it to his disciples, he said to them, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this cup is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of this, and do this in remembrance of me. Friends, let us come to this table and be reminded. Reminded that our Savior is always there with us filled with faith in us to go wherever it is that we are being led. Come and receive these gifts, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Loving God, as we come to your table, we remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. May this bread and wine be for us a moment of grace, drawing us closer to you and to give to one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
We all have a lot of fears that we face, a lot of fears that try to hold us down. But Jesus is inviting us to move forward. And though we may not know, like Abraham, where it is that we are being led to go, it is still an invitation from Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So what will we do? How will we respond? Let us consider that response and let us do so as we stand as you're able and join together in singing our hymn of invitation, hymn number 343, verses 1, 2, and 3. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home. Let us sing. I know if any of you had a friend or a loved one who came to you and revealed a fear that they had or a need that they had and they didn't know what to do, you'd give them a word of encouragement. You'd guide them to where they could find some help. Even a stranger you would do that. If you saw they fell and broke your leg, their leg, you'd know, hey, we're going to call for an ambulance. You all know how to respond to people who are in need, people who are in fear. But do we keep in mind that there are so many people who we cross paths with who are so scared of the challenges that are before them every day? What do we say to them? Do we say, hey, there is a source that has so much faith and belief in you that you can overcome anything? And if you want to know more about this source, then why don't you come and join me at my church on Sunday? Or find my church online. Do we ever consider sharing that good news? That source of comfort and support and help to those who are struggling, to those who are in fear. Let us keep that in mind because we will cross paths with many this week who are living in fear. Let us offer them a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of faith that they can move forward. Even if they don't know where, they can move forward towards those better days. So as you go forth to share that good news, and the grace of God, the constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ, rest and abide with each and every one of you, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.